when does salvation occur? Now, there are many teachers and preachers out there who are teaching that you are saved. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Is that what Jesus taught? Is that even scriptural? Being saved for what? They really even address that. What are you being saved for or saved to? And what about the billions who lived and died throughout all of Earth's history, who never heard of Jesus because Jesus had never come on the scene yet? So how can they become his followers? How can they become air quote Christians? What about them? Are they just forgotten by God? Is God that cruel? Christianity paints God as a vindictive and a cruel God. Let me show you something so that you can examine this for yourself. What is one being saved for? Eternal life. Now, let me back up a little bit here because there are two salvations mentioned in Scripture. The first salvation, each and every human being to have ever been born benefits from this first salvation. And what is that? A guarantee to be resurrected from the dead when they die. That's a promise Jesus made at John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. He said, do not be amazed at this, for all in their graves, did you see that? All in their graves will hear his voice and come out. And we could also go to Acts chapter 24, verse 15, and read the same thing. So all persons who have died and who will die are guaranteed or saved to a resurrection from the dead. This is not the same salvation to eternal life. That's something different. Nicodemus didn't understand that either. And there's a video that I did on that, and I'll leave a link in the description, or I'll place it up here so you can check it out. Nicodemus did not understand what Jesus was saying to him with regards to being born again, being born again from the dead, the resurrection. So all persons, all human beings, thanks to Christ's sacrificial death, and thanks to God's love, and love for us in sending his son, all are saved to being resurrected from the dead when they die. And that is a free gift. That's by God's grace. There aren't any conditions placed upon that salvation that is being resurrected from the dead. That is a free gift. However, the salvation to eternal life is conditional. That's not what I'm saying. That's what Jesus says. I know that there are preachers and teachers out here who are saying that, nope, or you're saved. Well, that's what they say. I cannot listen to human beings. I must listen to my master, Christ Jesus. And this is what he says. Now, those individuals can ignore what Jesus says. That's their choice. I'm not going to do that. But if one goes to Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 9 down to verse 13, this is what Jesus says with regards to salvation. He says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. So Christ's followers are going to be persecuted and put to death. Yet, there are many Christians out there who are teaching this rapture thing, that when Christ returns, he's going to take them off of the earth, and then all the persecution and the great tribulation begins. That's not what Jesus says here. He says, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. If you are a follower of Christ, are you prepared for that impending event in the future? Are you? Or is your hope in some fictitious rapture, which I see many air quote Christians making predictions on when it's going to occur and those predictions never come to pass. And then Jesus says this, he says, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Do all of the nations today hate Christ's followers? Absolutely not. Air quote Christians hate one another. You see them out here in a YouTube space and outside of the YouTube space hurling insults and slander and saying some of the most hateful things toward their own so-called brethren in the Lord. A war wages between two Christian countries, Russia and Ukraine. What is wrong with that picture? So no, all of the nations today do not hate Christ's followers. So this is referring to a future time period where 
all of the nations will. That time is not now. So yes, his followers will be hated by all the nations because of him. Then Jesus goes on to say at verse 10, at that time, at that time when all the nations will hate his followers, many will succumb to the pressure. Many will turn away from the faith. Yet I hear these many teachers and preachers out here talking about, oh, you're saved. And once you get saved, you can't lose your salvation. For the benefit of what they're saying, if a person was indeed saved and they can't lose the salvation, Jesus says something different here. He says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. How do you reconcile that? You can't. You simply ignore and deflect. No one today is saved with regards to eternal life. That's conditional and it must be earned. In order for one to have entry into God's kingdom, we must prove ourselves faithful. I'm going to show you that too. But let's finish up with what Jesus says here. And Jesus says, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now, here's the thing. Verse 13. Jesus says this, not me. Jesus says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stand firm to what end? Is the end here? Has the end arrived? No. What is it that one must stand firm through? or stand faithful through the great tribulation. The great tribulation has not occurred yet. The great tribulation is more than a thousand years yet future. This is something incredibly powerful and something incredibly great that Christianity has not presented to the people because Christianity doesn't know. It doesn't know. And if it doesn't know, how can those who are a part of it know? They don't know either. Now, why would I say that one must stand firm through the future great tribulation and then, if they come out of that faithfully, will be saved? Will be, not are, will be saved. You see, Jesus didn't say that if you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Jesus never taught that. Human beings do. Jesus says that if one stands firm to the end, then they will be saved. We have to be tested. Our faith will be tested. If one goes to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 down to verse 14, we see when salvation to eternal life occurs. And if you accept this, then you will come to understand that you're not saved to eternal life. That's something yet future, and your faith has to be proven. Check this out. Revelation chapter 7, let's begin with verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. John saw a crowd of people on earth whose numbers were so vast, you couldn't even count them. Today, we can count the earth's population. It's just moved above 8 billion people. But here John says he sees a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. People envision that they have to be in heaven to stand before God's throne. No, one can stand before God's throne here on earth. I do. I stand before God's throne in heaven. If you are a U.S. citizen, for example, let's say if you worked uh, for an embassy in some other land, and I used to work for an embassy when I was in foreign service, even though I'm in that country overseas, a U.S. embassy, even though it's built on the soil in another country, is an extension of the United States government. So if I'm in danger, say, for example, in that country over there, wherever that country is, where there's a U.S. embassy, I can run into that embassy and I am protected. Once I go through the gates of that U.S. embassy, it is as if I'm right here in the United States. 
you don't have to be in heaven to stand before God's throne. But yet we see here that there's a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. If their numbers are so vast, where do they come from? The resurrection. Billions have died and remain to this day in their graves. When I die, I will go into my grave and I will wait there like everyone else to be resurrected. So there are billions who have died long before Jesus even came on the scene who will be resurrected. That's why we see that there's a, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, verse 10, notice when those who are dressed in white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, when they cry salvation. They cry out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So here we see them crying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now let's continue because it gets really interesting now. Verse 11, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Amen to what? To what the great multitude who are dressed in white robes holding palm breaths in their hands had said up here. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So all of the angels who are around God's throne and the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And they say, Amen again. Now check this out. At verse 13, Then one of the elders asked me, that is, asked John, These in the white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? So one of the elders asked John this, and John says, You know, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So at verse 10, we see a great multitude whose numbers no one could count, who come out of every nation, tribe, people, and language, and they're holding palm branches in their hands and their robes are white. We see them coming out of the great tribulation. So they don't cry, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb before the great tribulation. They cry out this song or this utterance after they have come out of the great tribulation. So the elder asked John, who are they? Who are these persons who are dressed in white robes and who are holding these palm branches in their hands? John didn't know, but the elder knew, and he tells John, these are they who come out of the great tribulation. So what is this narrative that many of these air quote Christians who teach the rapture and that they're going to escape persecution and death in the great tribulation, what is that? It's a lie. Jesus did not teach that. Salvation does not come until one comes out of the great tribulation, not before it. So if you are a follower of Christ, prepare yourselves because in the future days, even when you will have died and you're resurrected, there will be a great tribulation awaiting us. We will have to stand firm through that. And if we faithfully stand firm through it, then we will be saved. Then we will be among the ones who will cry out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's more. Because some of you will not be convinced. It's not my job to convince you. You have to convince yourselves. You have to reconcile this for yourselves. And ask yourselves, are you being lied to? Are you going to follow behind men 
who teach things that Christ did not. But there's more. Stay in the Revelation, but let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and let's read verse 10. And let's see if Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 aligns itself with what Jesus said at Matthew chapter 24 verse 9 to verse 13. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Christ's followers are going to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you life. That's eternal life as your victor's crown. So do you see the condition there? If you stand faithful through all of that, through the persecution, the suffering, being put in prison, even to the point of death, if you remain faithful through all that, you will be given life, that is eternal life, as your victor's crown. So yes, this aligns itself with what Jesus said, that the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. No one today is saved with regards to eternal life. If persons are telling you that, they are lying to you or they are in error. They themselves don't know. I give all persons benefit of the doubt for not knowing. Jesus did. In prayer to his father, in his last moments before he died, Jesus cried out in prayer to his father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do or they don't know what they're doing. So I know I'm fully aware that there are billions of persons out there who don't know. The harvest is great, very great, but the workers are few. Yet there are false teachers out there, I'm fully aware of that as well, who fight against Christ while at the same time coming across as if they are for Christ. That's a deception. It would be one thing if they taught what Jesus taught. Jesus never taught rapture. Jesus never taught that he was God. Jesus never taught Trinity. Where is that? Jesus never taught that you are saved to eternal life, that all you have to do is accept him as your Lord and Savior and you are saved to eternal life. Jesus never taught that. Jesus did teach that salvation to eternal life is conditional. If one reads that entire account that Jesus was having between, or discussion that Jesus was having between Nicodemus, the Pharisee, about being born again and seeing God's kingdom and entering God's kingdom, Nicodemus didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was referring to dying, being buried, going back into the earth again, and being raised up out of the earth. At that point, now you can see God's kingdom, yet not entered it yet. Entry into God's kingdom is conditional. It requires a testing. Your faith, our faith, must be tested. That is what Jesus taught. And I've just presented to you those scriptures. Now, some will still prefer to believe that they are saved. But they will be in for a very rude awakening when no rapture will come and they will learn the hard way. And I've learned things the hard way. So bad tasting medicine isn't always a bad thing. It can be a good thing that they're not saved to eternal life. They will have to go through the future great tribulation and have their faith tested. Jesus did. Think about it. Prior to the Son of Man ascending into heaven, what happened to him? He was tested. By who? The devil. He was persecuted. By who? Human beings. He was put to death. By who? Human beings. But through all of that, he remained faithful. And he has eternal life. He's with his Father as I speak. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for all of you. But you have to get this right. Christianity will not give it to you right. That's why it's important that we not follow behind human beings. 
Let God be true and every human being a liar. That should be our mindset. We're messed up. We can speak truthful things, but we will mix in that truth things that are not truthful, which makes the entire thing a lie. Deceptive. Listen to Christ. Why? Because he is the truth. He is our leader. I cannot overemphasize this because if you can do that, if you can take courage not to be swayed by smooth talking human beings and their religions and you cling to Christ and listen to his voice, that is his teachings, because if you know his teachings, you will know what he did not teach. So therefore, if you've got these individuals out here who are teaching and saying things, you'll say to yourself, my master didn't teach that. You're false. You're on the right path. You're allowing Christ to be your teacher and your leader because he's the only one who knows the way to the Father. And the Father is the only one who can grant and give eternal life. This is R. Jerome Harris, the disciple. Thank you for listening.